Hello, once again. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Premier League. Now that we've paused for the World Cup, effectively it's half time, I thought now would be a good time just to do a quick pause and reflection and a summary or a review of where we are in the Premier League at the moment. Now, if we look at the table as it stands, uh, with 14 games or 15 games for some played, we have Arsenal leading the way um, with a five-point gap over Manchester City, who are the pre-season favourites. Um, and only just two points behind them, or having played a game more, is Newcastle United. Um, rounding off the top four, we have Tottenham, followed by Manchester United, Liverpool, Brighton up in seventh, uh, and then Chelsea eighth, Fulham having an incredible season, as are Brighton rounding off the top ten. Now, those who are in major trouble um, at the bottom of the season, at the bottom of the table, I should say, include Wolves, who have appointed Julian Lopetegui, who will take over after the World Cup, albeit he's now got an opportunity with those who aren't playing international football uh, to work with him on the training pitch. Uh, Southampton, who Nathan Jones has come in to replace Ralph Hasenhutl, and Nottingham Forest, who have kept faith with uh, Cooper as manager. If we start at the bottom then, in terms of tradition when we have a full season, the team that's bottom at Christmas more often than not is the team that will get relegated. Having played 15 games, which is amongst the most in the league, Wolves have only amassed 10 points. Now, it's not quite half time. There are another four games to go. It is entirely possible that seeing there's only a three point gap, or I should say four point gap to get to safety, that Wolves, couple of wins, could see them come out of the bottom three. They haven't played well at all all season, and they don't have a goal threat. So the thing that Lopetegui is going to have to do, either through coaching or through dipping his hand into the transfer market, he needs to find goals. He needs to get more of uh, an effort-based, higher work rate, emphasis on going forward, and somebody who can put the ball in the back of the net. Southampton. Nathan Jones has got a big ask on his hands. They hadn't played well uh, under Ralph Hasenhutl for a while, and they'd had some very, very big defeats. I think a couple of eight or even nine nil uh, record equaling defeats over the last year or so uh, under his management. The club were definitely stagnating. They were happy to sort of keep afloat and just maintain Premier League status without really looking to kick on and progress. For a while, they were a feeder club to teams like Liverpool, They've had to sell their best players for many, many years now. Even with the likes of Wayne Bridge to Chelsea or Gareth Bale to Spurs, Theo Walcott or Alex Oxlade Chamberlain both going to Arsenal. Um, keeping their best players like James Ward Prowse, for example, um, that that that's going to be key to 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 them being able to battle the drop. Um, if they can bring in one or two in the transfer market add a little bit of quality or something a little bit different. That's where um, Southampton need to kind of look at. They need somebody who can put the ball in the back of the net and they need to tighten up defensively. Nottingham Forest. Um, we still haven't seen Nottingham Forest come good considering the number of players that they signed uh, in the summer. We saw signs that they were improving. We saw signs that the likes of, say, Jesse Lingard were beginning to get themselves into a bit of form. Um, Gibbs White looked like he was coming good. So they invested heavily in terms of numbers and in terms of money. Started to get a bit of a run together. Small little unbeaten run going. World Cup might have come at a bad time for them. Um, they need to show a little bit more in, a, in an attacking sense. Cooper has sort of gone away from a little bit of his values to make them more difficult to play against because they were shipping goals. Uh, too many easy goals. And they need to repeat performances like they did against Liverpool, where they battle, they work hard. When they get opportunities, they take them. Um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they stay up. They're only a point behind Everton. They're not scoring enough goals. They're not getting enough out of their high-profile summer signings. In response to that, the teams above them, the likes of Everton and West Ham, they're in free fall. They are not getting the best out of their creative players. They're not playing with enough energy. They are conceding too many soft goals. Both teams, Moyes and Lampard, need to plug those holes quickly. They've got enough defensive solidarity 
in terms of the names on the team sheet. They just need to start playing like that now. Um, in Everton's case, it doesn't help that Calvert-Lewin's been injured. They don't have anyone else who can come in and score a lot of goals. Alex Awobi is a scorer of great goals, not just not a great scorer of goals. So they don't have enough goals in the team. Um, we've seen when they play the likes of Manchester United, they can get up for games and they can raise their level. But they need to do that week in, week out. And that's what's not happened. They've been too easy to play against, especially when they're away from home. In the case of West Ham, too many of their good players have either been unavailable or have been underperforming. Lanzini normally offers them something a little bit different in terms of creativity. Sushek is usually a big, great threat, which we normally associate with a David Moyes side, like a, a Fellaini or someone um, in years gone by at Everton. For West Ham, if one or two players go missing, if Antonio isn't scoring, there's not enough up top. There's not enough of a plan B or a C if plan A isn't working. Normally, they're quite difficult to play against, uh, but this season they've conceded too many goals. It's It's been too easy a fight for teams to score against West Ham, and there hasn't been enough coming back from them. They've got a great squad. Um, this was a team that was fighting for European qualification last year. A win or two and a nice run of games could see West Ham jump the table very, very quickly. It's just... Is it down to luck that so many players are off form at the moment? Or is it down to management? I'm not really sure. If we look a little bit more up the table, I think we need to give Brentford huge amounts of credit. Uh, one of, if not the smallest budget in the league. Thomas Frank has worked miracles, really. Firstly, to keep them up last season. And secondly, again, maintaining top 10 position. Um, small ground, small attendance relative to some of the other players that... Uh, players in terms of clubs I should say so the revenue is an awful lot less um Ivan Tony's continuing to score at an alarming rate Thomas Frank is showing himself to be a very astute tactician recently going to Manchester City and winning and deservedly so they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with City and over the course of the 90 minutes had the better chances could have scored three or four so Brentford are there on merit another team that deserves mention um is, is what Marco Silva's doing at Fulham. Um, he, he got a little bit of credit when he was in charge of Hull and almost got them to safety after having a terrible first half to the season and him coming in and almost getting them to safety. His stock was high. And despite not doing particularly well at, say, uh, Watford, for example, when he came back to England, he still had enough of an allure about him to be given the Fulham job. And you have to say... He has shown himself to be a good, pragmatic fit for Fulham. He has shown that he wants flair players, such as signing Pereira from Manchester United and putting his faith in Mitrovic. He's made them solid, but they know how to play. Um, you know, this is a team whose goal difference stands just under zero, which when you consider they are a promoted side, you don't expect them to score a lot of goals, but you would expect them to concede a lot. Actually, that's not a bad return in terms of a goal difference. They are in the top 10 and they have given everyone a game. Just ask Liverpool when they went to Craven Cottage. They are a threat from out wide. They can put the ball in the box. Mitrovic is a handful and they will compete. It's not so easy to, to, to score goals at Craven Cottage. Ask Manchester United who had to work their socks off for 94 minutes before... Uh, getting uh, the winning goal and they rode their luck by the way Fulham could have could have scored a couple themselves so they deserve a fantastic mention um Brighton obviously Graham Potter I did a, a an episode on him link is in the description he's obviously gone to Chelsea and funnily enough Brighton are now above Chelsea Chelsea were I believe fourth when Graham Potter took over they've now dropped to eighth although he needs to be given a little bit of time. Again, I, I talk about this in the episode. He needs to be given time for a number of circumstances there. His replacement at Brighton has walked into a club that's very stable, has a clear identity, has a strategy. They know where they're going. And a very, very good team, a settled team, where Potter in the summer had sprinkled a little bit of quality to what was already a very good and settled side. Um... Brighton are going to be knocking on the door for qualification to Europe. They might fall just a little bit short, especially because I expect Chelsea to find form in the second half of the season. 
and I would expect Brighton probably to finish somewhere in the region of 8th to 10th, but they deserve great credit for the start that they've made to the season. Uh, Liverpool, they've had a few stutters this season. On their day, they are right up there as one of the best teams in the league. There's a little bit of a concern about the lack of depth in the squad, um, but they've certainly improved their form when they were sort of in the bottom half of the table for the first quarter or so of the Premier League. They have won a couple of matches. They've looked a little bit better. They are a different side where Mohamed Salah looks like he's up for a match. He has looked a little pedestrian at times this season, and that's been reflected in some of Liverpool's performances. They've been more leaky at the back. Uh, they've been easier to play against, and they haven't been as much of a threat attacking-wise as we've become accustomed to for the last couple of seasons. Uh, they've got great options up top. When he's fit, Jota, Firmino, Nunes, Salah, Diaz. That's as strong an attacking group as anyone else in the Premier League. Um, midfield, you could argue, maybe is a bit of an issue. If Fabinho can come back and add that base, that is a huge difference to Liverpool. Uh, if Henderson gets back to having the engine that we know from him, doing the simple things right, that's a big plus. If they can keep Thiago fit, he adds that little bit of star quality, the passing, the metronomic control in the midfield. When those players are either not at their best or are missing through injury, it's when the likes of, say, Milner come in where you notice a bit of a, a drop-off. Certainly, Naby Keita hasn't worked there. Certainly, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, the injuries and the lack of form means he is not really a viable, consistent option there. They've had to play the likes of Harvey Elliott. They've had to play the likes of Curtis Jones. Um, obviously Carvalho who was more known as being a wide player has come in and sort of played like an inverted 10 at times these are all young players who should be brought in to play with experienced players in the same way that Roy Keane joined Manchester United played alongside Paul Lintz and Brian Robson for a while before taking their place did the same with the likes of Nicky Butt and Paul Scholes you had the likes of David Beckham coming up on the on the wing looking to take on and beat Andre Kanchelskis. It's not like they came in one day and the entire team was ripped up and with only three appearances under their belt, that was it. Whilst the infamous line, you don't win anything with kids, was true. It's only because those players had come in and played games and had shown their worth in a consistent basis, even played in FA Cup finals, that Sir Alex Ferguson was able to put his trust fully into that particular generation of player. Jurgen Klopp has almost been forced to because either the other senior players he has in the squad, such as 406-year-old James Milner or Naby Keita that just hasn't worked, or the injury-prone Alex Oxlade Chamberlain, have been unavailable. So Curtis Jones, although he's 22 or there or thereabouts, hasn't had the run of games because of injury. Harvey Elliott, who's been there for a year, year and a half, he's had some appearances and looked good. Would you say that he was in a position to be the creative force of a midfield three for Liverpool right now? Probably not. They've done an admirable job. And it's it's testament to everyone at Liverpool that they've climbed the table. But you can definitely say that they are not the team that they were from a few years ago. They are only um, seven points um, off the top four. Uh, with a game in hand, I should point out. Um... It's, it's going to be a battle to overturn seven points. Um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. Um, they've definitely underperformed so far. But they're in a better moment now than they were earlier in the season. So if you're a Liverpool fan, certainly looking towards the second half of the season, you'd be looking with far more optimism and confidence than earlier in the season. The fact that Jota will not be at the World Cup, Diaz will not be at the World Cup, Firmino is not at the World Cup. You've got a lot of options there who will be fresh. Manchester United. United are probably where most people would expect them to be at this point in time. Their starting eleven has not been good enough to compete for top four or above for the last couple of seasons. And the lack of depth in the squad has meant that over the course of 30 plus games, they just don't have the options um, to call upon to consistently mount a challenge for the top four. That said, 
Although Eric Ten Hag has had to move away from his preferred philosophy how to play football, because Manchester United players probably just aren't quite good enough to do it, he's found a pragmatic medium where at times they are able to move the ball quite well. They are able to press a little bit more intelligently. Um, but at the same time, he's been able to make them tougher to play against. He's tightened them up at the back most of the time. Um, and they're able to get themselves in a position where they can turn defeat into draw and draw into win, which they weren't doing last year. Now, that does come with the odd bad performance, either down to the players not being good enough, not having that mentality, or the manager just making some poor decisions. The Brighton and Brentford losses at the start of the season were down to Ten Hag. He didn't understand the league, probably underestimated the combative spirit in England, um, probably underestimated just how bad Manchester United were compared to where he wanted them to be to play his football and compared to where they genuinely were. Since then, as I said, he's found a bit more of a compromise. He's brought in artillery in the likes of Anthony Casemiro. They've made a great difference. Martinez does look like a revelation. But the lack of depth is a problem. If Varane isn't playing, then any other option they have brings that entire defence down by too big a gap. When you compare it to, say, the likes of Arsenal or Manchester City, who are a solid, competitive, combative back line, but also can play, when Varane is out, United are so, so much short, whether they bring in Lindelof or Maguire, it's big shoes to fill, and neither of them can do it. So United are probably one quality centre-back, short, um, to sustain being frugal at the back. Luke Shaw and Malassia have performed well on the left flank. You could toss a coin at the moment as to who you would want to play there. On the right-hand side, I think huge amount of respect to Diogo Delo, who wasn't really looked at previously, um, wasn't really trusted, perhaps b because the United don't really have another option. By default, Eric Ten Hag has looked at him and thought, he'll be my, my number one. I don't think there was too much doubt about him going forward. He's a Portuguese rampaging fullback a bit like someone like Jao Cancelo good with the ball at his feet not bad at delivering the ball he could work on his attack threat in terms of getting it behind and pulling it back or even having a go himself um, defensively he's improved himself fantastically having some time in Italy on loan looks like he's improved in terms of his spatial awareness and his ability to sniff out danger and he's far more consistent than he was before. Is he a world-class right-back? The answer is no. United are a little bit short there. But certainly if United brought somebody else in, I don't think Delo would be so much of an issue. And I think if you do have competition there, all that does is improve United. Um, no doubt. Um, they are still a little bit short. But the gap has closed in that regard. De Gea with the ball at his feet is still short when you compare it to, say, Ramsdale, Edison, Allison, Lloris. He isn't a ball-playing goalkeeper. He's not a sweeper-keeper. Um, but his ability to save uh, and, and, and his communication now has improved as well. So, unless somebody like Jan Olblak or someone left field becomes available or they do decide to finally take a punt on Dean Henderson, I think De Gea stays and will remain number one. In midfield, um, Casemiro has done a fantastic job. He definitely, in terms of a holding midfielder, has been what Manchester United have been missing, and it makes it even more unbelievable that when Mourinho was manager, they didn't sign Fabinho from Monaco when they had the opportunity to for about £25 million. It's inexplicable. Anyway, fast forward a few years, they finally have somebody who can fill those shoes. Somebody who has an element of Roy Keane about him and has an element of Michael Carrick about him. The goal, or what turned out to be the winning goal at Everton, which was a recovery tackle by Casemiro and the vision and composure to play a splitting through ball for an old to run on two and score, showed a mixture of those two type of player that I just referred to. United could do with a replacement. When he's not in the team, neither McTominay or Fred are the answer. So somebody like Saicedo from Brighton would make for an excellent addition. Firstly, because he wouldn't cost stupid money. Secondly, because he's extremely young. 
He's got that energy, the exuberance, and he could learn from Casemiro. Both speak Spanish. You've got that sort of South American mentality. Um, you could build a double pivot with those two. And you couldn't really ask for a better mentor for somebody like Saicedo to come in and learn from. You'd be building for the future as well. In terms of the midfield, they pursued Frankie de Jong uh, for what seems like 100 years uh, with no real um, sign that he wanted to come to United. Barca need to sell, still need to sell. They would accept an offer to balance the books, but the player doesn't want to come. You need a ball-carrying midfielder so you could put somebody like Caicedo in there because he can bring the ball forward through the lines. He would cost half the price of somebody like a Declan Rice, who would also be an excellent option. But you'd be paying a premium because he's a key player and captain of West Ham and he's English. So it would be a flip of a coin. Rice probably ahead in terms of quality and level now, but would cost a hell of a lot more. The other option would be to go for something like Jude Bellingham, who has got that, everyone keeps talking that he's got a Steven Gerrard or a young Roy Keane or a young Brian Robson element to his play. Without a shadow of a doubt, he does. Um, if you want to steal a march on the likes of a Liverpool, a by strengthening yourself massively and secondly by weakening them in terms of options, he would be a fantastic option to go and get. Yes, he would cost a lot of money, but he is 19 years of age. Provided you looked after this player, you could have a player in the middle of your in the middle of your pitch for 15 years. He could do a little bit of what Paul Scholes did in terms of picking the ball up and hitting passes. We've seen with Dortmund, if you let him have a little bit more of an attacking influence, he can spank a ball, he can get on the end of it and, and knock it in with his head. That He's got an element of Frank Lampard about him that he can ghost in late in the day to pick up scraps and score goals. Plus he's got that Gerrard engine to him he could play as a two he can play in a three um i think if you're going to spend that sort of money do bellingham is probably the, the option to go for if, it, if if i had the option and Manchester united fans probably would disagree i think the likes of mctominay and fred have had enough opportunity now you could argue they're squad players but i don't think they're good enough if united have serious aspirations of winning the league I would let the pair of them go. I would bring in cover for Casemiro, like Caicedo from Brighton. I would bring in a box-to-box -box player, somebody like Jude Bellingham. I would bring in another creative midfielder to take the burn burden off Bruno Fernandes, seeing as Van der Beek does not look like it's going to happen for him. Somebody like James Madison, who would not cost the, the earth. I think would be a fantastic addition. If you had a Manchester United midfield with options which were Casido or Casemiro at the base, options including Ericsson, Bellingham, Fernandez, or Madison as attack stroke ball carrying creative players, I think suddenly you're looking at a United team that can dominate or play on the break. Um, up front, it again, if you want to have a look at my previous videos about the Cristiano Ronaldo interview, it looks pretty certain he's going to leave. So United needs somebody who's going to play up top. Do you go for a target man or do you go for somebody who gives you a bit of mobility? Now, Anthony Martial apparently is the perfect forward type player for Eric Ten Hag. That's Eric Ten Hag's words directly there. The problem is he's not fit. It's a pretty sad indictment that a player that looked like he was out of the door and had played his last game as recently as January of this year when he went on loan to Sevilla is now arguably the most critical player in Manchester United's front line. If you want a dynamic forward, then you could go for somebody like Cody Gakpo, who perhaps is not quite as agile as Martial in terms of a top speed. But the timing of his runs is very, very good. We saw against Senegal when he ran from deep on the blind side, not afraid to stick his head on the end of something. This is a player who knows where the goal is, can sniff a goal, can time his runs brilliantly, and possibly might even bring something out in Van der Beek if you're going to keep him. Somebody who can ping a ball in, or Fernandez who can ping a ball in, uh, and he can make off off the ball runs. Um, the closest to Ronaldo that you're probably going to get at an affordable price in terms of his aerial ability. Um, if you want somebody who is the closest to Anthony Martial in terms of type, well, the obvious answer there would be Kylian Mbappe. But United are not going to spend that sort of money on Mbappe 
yes, that's probably the worst hint set of rhyming you've ever heard. I can only apologise. Mbappe looks like he's going to go to Real Madrid. Um, whether he can do something clever like Ronaldo did to force a cut price move, or if Real Madrid are going to have to put their hand in their pocket, possibly by selling the likes of Eden Hazard, that remains to be seen. But it looks like Mbappe is eventually going to end up there. So you're not going to get the closest like for like for Martial. You're going to have to do a compromise. Wouldn't surprise me to see somebody like uh, Gapo end up um, at Manchester United. Tottenham. Tottenham are fourth. If they finish there now, I think they bite your hand off. Tottenham fans are complaining that it takes them to have to go a goal or two down before they start playing. And when they start playing, they look a threat. They gave Liverpool two goal head start and could have easily drawn that game to all. Why they have to do that is beyond me. Is it because Conte is too pragmatic for his own good? Is it because he doesn't trust the players that he's got? I don't know. If it's either of those two options, considering that he has shaped this squad, especially during the last January transfer window where he brought in a lot of those players himself, that doesn't reflect that well on him. I appreciate that the mentality of Tottenham is not that hunger winner's mentality that's not a knock Tottenham fans it's just stating the truth it's been years of lack of success so you can't say that they've got a winning mentality but why does it take you guys to go a couple of goals down before you show that you're a good side is beyond me they went to Marseille recently and it looked like it was the a team of strangers suddenly Marseille score going at half time you think Tottenham are in trouble here they're going out of Europe second half they come out they're the better team win the game if Tottenham play 90 minutes as if they're losing, they'll give anyone a game. And they'll certainly finish in the top four. It's, it, the problem is, for the longer in the season that they seem to require that, that kind of, that challenge, like we saw against Liverpool, they're going to come unstuck. Now, if we look at the table now, Tottenham have got a three-point advantage over, over Manchester United. Yes, they've got the goal difference as well. If United were to win their game in hand and go level on points. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that United beat Tottenham. They've done it already this season. And therefore, United would jump above them. That's excluding Liverpool's resurgence, which we spoke about already as well. Uh, it's touch and go for Tottenham. They're going to have to buck their ideas up. They might give Conte some money in the transfer window, and we might see Tottenham improve with a couple of extra signings. He needs, a bit like with England and with Gareth Southgate, he just needs to get the shackles off his players and allow them to play at that intensity for 90 minutes. If he does that, Tottenham will be fine and they'll finish the top four. Top three. Newcastle United, they are third. Now, some people might say, well, they've just been bought by one of the Middle Eastern states, therefore they're so loaded with money, it was only a matter of time. Okay, fair enough. But Newcastle haven't splashed the cash. Eddie Howe's done a fantastic job. One of his biggest criticisms when he was manager of, of Bournemouth was what he was wonderful to watch in terms of what he wanting them to play, pass and move football, keep it on the deck, like Brian Clough from years gone by, or Pep Guardiola. It came with an almost negligence when it, on, on the defensive element of the game, whether they didn't press enough or they were just too soft or gave away too many goals too cheaply. Bournemouth had a soft underbelly. And it was a criticism that was thrown at Eddie Howe for a number of seasons before they got relegated. At Newcastle, he's come in, and even before he spent any money, he reorganised the team, put players in the right positions, made them more of a threat going forward, but made them harder to play against. He made them meaner. He made them more, more frugal in terms of giving away goals. And that's continued into this season. He's getting a tune out of his attacking players. Bruno in the middle of the pitch has been a revelation. Almiron has been like a whirlwind. Jack Grealish should, uh, should insult him more often. And defensively, Dan Byrne, the goalkeeper, as a defensive unit, you can't really fault them. Um, they've, they've conceded fewer goals than Manchester City. They've conceded the same number of goals as Arsenal. They've conceded about half the number of goals of Tottenham. Um... They've got, I think it's equal best defensive record in the Premier League. Um, and it, when it comes to scoring goals, 
I think they've got the fourth highest attack off the top of my head. So that combined, without going out and buying a World 11's worth of players in the way that Chelsea did, in the way that Manchester City did when they got bought, you have to give Eddie Howe unbelievable credit. He has organically and sustainably managed this group, risen them up the table without spending the earth. In fact, you look at the squad makeup, there is a large number of players that were there under Steve Bruce. So he deserves incredible praise for the man management and the tactical astuteness and his transfer market wheelie dealing. He is right up there to be a contender for manager of the season without a shadow of a doubt. Manchester City. The preseason favourites haven't been too bad this season. They're averaging just under two points a game. Uh, but they have had an almost complacent susceptibility about them this season. They've lost a couple of matches, one of which, of course, was to Brentford. Uh, they drew with Newcastle United. They salvaged a draw in that game. Newcastle really should have won. They are not the invincible side that many would have you, or many would portray them to be. I don't think they've replaced Fernandinho to the same level in that midfield. I think they're a little bit easier to play through. Um, I think offensively, if you can keep Haaland quiet, which Brentford did a very good job of doing when they beat them, if you can nullify Kevin De Bruyne, I know that's a lot easier said than done, but they are definitely get atable. We saw when Liverpool beat them, when Liverpool play like a Liverpool side, which is to compete and get in their face and bully them, you can, you can beat them. Brentford did the same and had a similar success. I think with City, because they are now five points behind Arsenal, they're going to have to beat Arsenal at least once this season. It's not beyond the realms of possibility that they will go on a five, six, seven, ten game winning run, including possibly beating Arsenal. They're going to have to. Um... I'm just excited that City are going to have to play catch-up and they're not going to run, run away with it by probably 10 points. I said before the start of the season that City would probably be champions and they'd probably win by 5 or 6 points. I stand by that. It wouldn't surprise me if they did the double over Arsenal and it wouldn't surprise me as a, as a result of that, especially if they beat them the second time, if that was the, the deal-breaker where they got a 3, 4, 5-point lead over Arsenal. I think where the key difference is, starting level wise, Arsenal have shown great quality, great balance, great consistency. This is the depth of squad which might hurt Arsenal. If Jesus or Odegaard got injured, do they have anyone who can come in and maintain that attacking creativity and goal scoring levels? Possibly not. With City, if Haaland gets injured, they've got Alvarez who can come on. They've got players who can play as a false nine, like Gundawan, for example. They've got such great strength and depth. Um, Arsenal don't quite have that luxury. That might be their Achilles heel. If Arsenal players come back from the World Cup injury-free, and if they can maintain their levels without incurring injuries or silly suspensions through January into February, we have a real title fight on our hands. And speaking of Arsenal now, Mikel Arteta, along with Eddie Howe, without doubt managers of the season. It's a flip of a coin between the two of them. For Arteta... To have taken Arsenal, who have not really been in the hunt for the Champions League the last couple of years. Yes, it was nip and tuck between them and Tottenham um, last season. But to now take them to the summit against the Manchester City side, who, in terms of personnel, are arguably stronger than ever before. Arteta deserves incredible credit. His football philosophy is only praised by those who are football purists. He hasn't broken the bank in terms of transfer fees. He is promoted from within and got bargains where he can, improving the likes of Ben White, Gabriel, Kieran Tierney, and grabbing bargains like Zinchenko, Gabriel Jesus, Odegaard when he was available, getting rid of players who he felt were bad influences, such as Lacazette, Aubameyang. He has created a team more balanced, more in his own image. He's getting a tune out of players like Granit Xhaka, you can't say anything other than incredible credit, incredible kudos, put respect on the man's name. We are seeing a top quality coach 
a top quality manager starting to take shape. Will it will it be enough this season? Said it a few minutes ago, City's strength and depth might be the telling factor. We haven't seen Arsenal have to really deal with adversity yet, where they've had a couple of players injured, suspended or whatever. If and when that happens, that's when Arsenal will be tested. And that's when City's sheer volume of number may be the difference. But if Arsenal keep their team together, if Arsenal even buy one or two, what a title race we have. If I was to say who's my manager of the season right now, by one percentage point, I would say it's Mikel Arteta. Just because of the fact that Arsenal, who were not in the Champions League, are now top of the pile. And it's not through some erroneous circumstance. This is not a COVID-affected season. This is against a City side who have got arguably the best striker in the world, against a City side that have maintained all of their players to be available, fit and on form. This is They deserve their, their first place on absolute merit. They are playing possibly the best football in the league, possibly the most balanced side in the league. Eddie Howe pushes him incredibly, incredibly closely just for the fact that he's taken Newcastle from where they were under Steve Bruce to where they are now, playing very nice football getting tunes out of all of his players without spending money, without being tempted to go and spend 30, 40, 50, 60 on this player or that player, which he could in theory do. He has been very organic, very sustainable, very pragmatic in the way that he's gone and built the team. Similar to Arsenal, strength and depth could be a problem. Do they have the, the, the depth of quality of player that if they get suspension or an injury, um, could that affect them? The answer is yes. But credit where credit's due. They are where they are on merit. They have played some of the very best teams in the league and not lost. They shouldn't have lost at Liverpool. Won't comment on that game. Possibly should have beaten City. They are uh, serious contenders for the top four this season. Um, given United are a bit up and down and given Liverpool giving themselves a lot to do, I would make Newcastle favourites out of those three to finish in the top four. I think the top four as it is, whatever order, probably will finish as it is now. I think Liverpool and United will close that gap. It might be a toss of a coin. But given that Liverpool have given themselves seven points plus to make up, that's not easy. Um, but yes, I would say that uh, Eddie Howe deserves just second in terms of the order of merit of managers so far. Can't wait for the second half of the season. In the meantime, I hope that the feast of football at the World Cup continues. Hope you're all well. Hope you all take care. Catch you soon.